What's going on, Doombots? Tony Skinjili here with a kind of an add-on to the trios video I said. Now, in that video, I'd said I'm not going to go through every single team that exists right now and discuss which trios they are, because that's happening in this video. By request, more often than not. I'm also going to make an infographic uh, for this. It'll probably go up with a link to it. It'll be in my Discord, etc., 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 etc. You know how the drill goes. So... We're going to talk about them really quickly, each one, but uh, this core graphic right here, and I'll scroll down so you can see the Supernatural and Kree easily, will give you an idea of why there's a trio to a team. Now, all of these are teams, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, these are the teams that do have tags, you know what I mean? We did that conversation. And it's important to know the difference between what I'm recommending here and like when you're supposed to invest in other characters. What I'm telling you is the three characters on the team that uh, impact the team or whatever that team's supposed to do the most. Not the overall best versions of characters on that team, not the characters that have the most utility outside. When you want to look at what the team's purpose is, whether it be a war attack team, a war defense team, uh, a raid team, there are uh, three characters that fundamentally make that team work, and then there are characters that they don't need to be high investment to do what they need to do. So I don't want to go into that all over again. We're going to start from the beginning. So if you check it out right here, we have Brotherhood. The, the Brotherhood 1.0 and 2.0 are, are fundamentally the same team. It's just what teams they beat kind of make the difference. So because no matter what happens, the core of the Brotherhood is always Magneto, Pyro, and Juggernaut, you will never regret having a, a very high investment on those three characters. Now, Magneto being a high investment prevents his uh, ultimate from being resisted, as well as making him a little bit more tanky uh, for the fights that come up. Juggernaut is a big damage dealer, so any investment you put in Juggernaut, based on how that entire team works out, is going to be beneficial, as well as Pyro. You want to make sure that his bleed stacks do a lot of damage. You want to make sure that his focus is high enough. So regardless of whether you're using Mystique, Sabretooth, Toad Blob, or some combination of them, if this core of the team is strong, the other characters can kind of lag behind a little bit, and you should still be able to see a quite a bit of value where you're going to use this team, primarily in war offense. Uh, moving to the Inhumans, Similar concept. Inhumans are a war team, they're a pseudo raid team, but these three, Black Bolt, Yo Yo, and Crystal, are the core of the team. Now, Karnak, he's got pretty good focus to begin with, so he doesn't need to be that strong, and Quake is useless, and the first gun character to be replaced when more Inhumans come out, more likely than not. So, when you look at the three characters that are important, obviously, this is in no particular order, but eh, you can kind of figure it out backwards. Uh, Black Bolt's clearly the most important character to have at high investment. Uh, and then Yo-Yo is really important to have at high investment too, as she works with and without Black Bolt. Crystal really doesn't work too well without them other two characters, but with them, she's providing a huge deal of damage, as well as some pretty good healing in case things start to go south for you. So this is the core of the Inhumans team. Moving to as Guardians, surprise, surprise, we talked about this a little before. It's Hela, Thor, and Sif, because you do not need a high investment in Loki, and, and high investment doesn't mean no tier 4s. High investment means if you put as many materials into these characters as you can, whether it be gear or level or tier 4s or whatever you want to call it, these characters are going to do what they're supposed to. Uh, obviously, Sif, uh, as a tank, is going to be incredibly important to charging Thor's ultimate, so yeah, the order is kind of Hela, Thor, and Sif uh, as far as priority goes, but if those three are strong, it doesn't actually matter how strong overall, like the power level of the Heimdall and the Loki, those three characters should be able to carry the entire team. Uh, the Sinister Six is done pre-Doc Ock. Uh, I don't know how he's going to impact or what he's going to change regarding uh, that setup, but as of right now, the Trinity for the Sinister Six is actually Rhino, Shocker, and Vulture. Mysterio is incredibly important, but mostly because of the assists he calls. And since he's not the one doing the primary damage, you want to make sure that uh, some of the better characters are doing it. Green Goblin doesn't actually need Tier 4s. He's relatively tanky and does a decent amount of damage on his own, so he doesn't need a lot of investment. He's also most likely the, the character to leave off the team, as he has a little bit better utility outside. 
So if you invest in these three characters in Sinister Six first, and then bring the others up eventually, you'll end up with a stronger version of the Sinister Six team uh, for what they're going to do. Now, Sinister Six is a war defense team, so that's why uh, you want to invest as much as you can in the characters that do what they need to do immediately. Uh, Vulture and Shocker are incredibly fast, and Rhino is obviously tanky, so those are the guys who do the most. Also on war offense, if you're using them to beat up on, you know, Spider-Verse, maybe, or Defenders, those are the characters you want to go first and do the most damage as early as they can. Aim, fundamentally, it's Scientist Supreme, Graviton, and Aim Security. Any other character is completely modular. As a matter of fact, you could start adding characters that aren't on the aim team to this team in the other two slots, and you'll still get the most value you can, but the core of the aim team is those three characters, not really much of a conversation. Black Order is going to be interesting because, again, we're talking about the Black Order team, not the characters. Now, Corvus and Proxima are phenomenal. They work very well together. The entire Black Order is a very well-designed team overall. But the core of the Black Order, the success and failure of the Black Order, comes to with the strength of your Cole Obsidian, your Thanos, and your Ebony Maw. Uh, mostly because Cole Obsidian's counterattacks on those characters should be doing the most damage. So I know the priority looks a little strange, but the stronger your Cole is, uh, it doesn't matter how strong your Thanos or your Maw are, he's going to be hitting a lot more. As a matter of fact, if you just use those three and don't use the rest of the Black Order, you still end up with a pretty good Black Order team comp, or the core of the comp because uh, Thanos will taunt and then you'll get a lot more counterattacks or, you know, retaliations from Cole Obsidian. Uh, that said, this is a war... It is a war offense team. People are using it on war defense because new teams are hard to beat for a lot of people. But overall, either way, you want Cole Obsidian to be the primary damage dealer. The other two characters, Corvus Grave and Fox and Midnight, you could bring up whenever you want. The Defenders... I understand the concern when you see me even put the defenders on this list, but ultimately this comes from a conversation I've had with many people discussing which are the problems of fighting defenders teams, especially in war. Really strong defenders teams, the biggest threats on the team are not JJ and Daredevil. It's Iron Fist, Punisher, and Luke Cage. If Luke Cage gets to taunting, Iron Fist can do all of the work. Daredevil is kind of there to maybe get Punisher to do a couple of extra attacks, but he has a built-in dodge mechanic, so he should be a little bit more survival, and he doesn't do much damage, so if you're throwing up Deflex and then he moves on, you know, he passes away, you, you still end up getting a little bit of value to Daredevil. JJ is relatively tanky on her own, but everything JJ does is completely independent of her stats, except damage. She doesn't need it. Now, I wouldn't recommend necessarily working on uh, Luke Cage at all, but if you're trying to maximize the value of a defender's team, those three characters being the strongest will inevitably help you more than any other combination of characters. Fantastic Four is a war offense team. As a result, Namor is included in that conversation. Now, you're probably noticing, hey, Tony, Thanos doesn't have the Black Order tag, Punisher doesn't have the Defender tag, Namor doesn't have the Fantastic Four tag. Correct. That's why Teams vs. Tag exists. These are characters that are part of the team. Uh, Namor is one of the most important investments you have in the Fantastic Four. Invisible Woman gives the entire team survivability, so she's number two. And Thing is number three, just in the fact that every time he does take a turn, he can usually wreck one character. Uh, Human Torch. The problem is no matter how much you invest in him, he still becomes incredibly squishy. So it's very difficult to rely on a character like Human Torch to do the damage, uh, especially when you have characters like Namor who do pretty good damage on war offense, and of course Thing who does phenomenal damage war and outside, uh, and reads more of a passive than anything else with the assists. So as long as those characters are present, you should be okay. The core of the team should still be those three characters, at least right now. Guardians of the Galaxy, I don't have to go into too much detail, but Star Wars, Rocket, and Groot are the the core of the team, so insofar that you build other teams around those three characters. The BKT was built around those three. You know, so Mantis, Drax, Gamora, they can lag behind a bit. Uh, as long as the core of the team is doing the damage, you should be okay. Uh, Hydra, war defense team, so it stands to reason that having a very strong... Uh, Red Skull is incredibly important. That's not just for war defense, but just for anything else. Uh, the other characters, Hydra Sniper, 
He's a passive buff. He doesn't actually do an incredible amount of AoE damage. So, and he's going to resurrect a lot, so he's going to be doing his ability as often as he can. Same thing with Hydra Scientist. The heal isn't that important. The death proof is relevant. It's a two-turn cooldown. Should be fine. But as long as your Hydra Rifle Trooper, who is assisting all the time, and your Hydra Armored Guard, who heals himself and is tanking, uh, are strong, the rest of your team should follow suit. Moving down to Kree... Uh, now, obviously we're not including characters like Ultimus or uh, Korath, because they're not a part of a Kree team. A, there, there is no Kree team other than the Kree minions plus Ronin. That's the core of the Kree team, that's a team you'll see anywhere else. Now, you can include characters like Captain Marvel, but that's not the Kree team, those are just people with the Kree tag. Minerva's not even a member of the Kree team, she's just a character with the Kree tag, she's better on literally any other team. But for the Kree minions plus Ronin, the core investment you want to have is Ronin, Kree Reaper, and actually Kree Oracle. Because Kree is a war offense or defense team, and Oracle gives them a little bit of survivability, which is incredibly important when people are trying to fight them up. Plus, he gives out a lot of extra energy. He gives heals out when pretty much any Kree takes a turn. Uh, it gives them a lot of sustain. The team is not good overall, but if you want to make that team slightly better, which I guess you can... These are the three characters that make them operate a little bit better as a team, especially in those Gamma Raids where you may want to start using Kree that aren't Captain Marvel or Minerva. And if you did have to pick three other Kree to put with Captain Marvel and Minerva, it would probably be these three. Uh, moving into Marauders. Now, one, I'm not including Emma Frost for two reasons. One, she's not out, and two, she's not a Marauder. Uh, she, uh, unlike characters like Punisher, Thanos, and Namor, who have the word of their team in their kit. Emma Frost does not have the word Marauder anywhere to be seen, uh, but she does work with them. So when she comes out, there's a stand to reason that she might be an incredibly important member of the team. That said, Strife actually does not matter. Uh, the, peop the way Marauders are, and fundamentally should be for a long time, a war defense team. I have not lost because of Strife. Uh, the teams I've, I've lost two mystiques i've lost to sabertooth sabertooth is attacking anytime any other character takes a non-combat action sinister has two uh mystique has zero strife has one emma frost would end up having uh two i believe but then there's characters like shuri who have two um th there's a lot of options you have on the marauders team and sabertooth being strong will get a lot of extra damage and sabertooth is just damage but he's a lot of damage and he works with the rest of your team in the same way that punisher is just damage but it's a lot of extra assists on the defenders it's a lot of uh, aoe it's a big deal and mystique's survivability is kind of crazy if you've never fought a really strong mystique uh i'm sorry or a thank you or you're welcome i don't know what the correct way is because mystique can be incredibly insane if you have the right investment in her. She's very tanky on her own. She's resistant to a lot of things that you would otherwise want to deal with. She's constantly either dodging or in stealth. And when she works with Sinister, she's stealing buffs. Sinister's giving those buffs to the rest of the team. So if I had to work on three Marauders, it would be those three. And then, you know, personally, if you've seen my Marauders, you'll know that's exactly what has happened. My Strife is relatively high investment, but he's still lagging behind the rest of the characters because he doesn't need to be that strong anymore to do what he does, especially on more defense. The Mercs, I don't even know why this is a conversation. Taskmaster, Merc Lieutenant, Merc Riot Guard is the core of the team. You would never have a Merc team without those three characters. The stronger they are, the better overall your Merc team will be. Whomever the other two Mercs you end up putting on that team are, that's up to you and your decision. You know, whatever you want to work with, whatever your roster looks like, that's great. But if this is the core of the team, your team's going to have constant deflex, defense up, offense up, speed up. Taskmaster's going to be assisting all the time. If these are the characters you choose to work on, your Merc team is going to be as threatening on war defense as possible. At the same time, uh, if you are going to use the Mercs on any of the uh, raid nodes you can, or maybe as a Blitz team or anything like that, those are still the characters you want the strongest investment in because those are the characters that do the most for what the team does. Power Armor talked a little bit about this. Uh, War Machine, Ironheart, and Falcon. The uh, idea behind it is res everything Rescue does is her kit, so the only reason to invest in her is to make her survive. Uh, and the same thing with Iron Man, he spawns with a death proof because War Machine's present. 
Everything he does is based off his passive, and if he does survive long enough to do his ult, it's a single target ult that does kind of anemic damage, all things considered now, so you don't need much investment in them. You also don't need much of an investment in Falcon, so if you only had to invest in two, it would be War Machine and uh, Ironheart, but because Falcon is uh, a, it's a war team and because Falcon's ult gets stronger and attacks more times in war, it's one of those things where you just want Falcon's ultimate to do a ton of damage, and it can. So he's the third most important member of the Power Armor team when it comes to investment. You don't need many tier fours, you don't need much in there, but as far as bringing his overall power and damage up, he's the character you want to invest in. Your Power Armor team will do just fine. Shield, I know a lot of people think Coulson's worth investing in. That's actually completely untrue, because Coulson dying early means that any time that Shield Medic heals, she will also res Coulson. He doesn't have to survive much. A lot of what he does is calling assists from stronger characters. Uh, he's okay. You can have a strong Coulson. And then the other characters you can kind of invest in as you like. But if the core of your team, if Nick Fury is strong enough to survive, if Shield Security is strong enough to never die and block all the time, and if uh, Shield Medic is not going to get one or two shot, uh, you're going to have a better time. It's going to require stronger versions of like X-Men or Black Order teams in order to defeat that, just in general. Moving to Supernatural, Ghost Rider and Elsa kind of go without saying. They're the only damage dealers in the team, so you need them up there in order to kind of produce anything. Then the last character, Scarlet Witch, completely useless on the team. Can't wait to replace her with anyone. Blade, Morbius, who cares? Uh, Mordo and Doctor Strange are equal parts, right? Which one is better? The truth is... Everything Mordo does, Mordo will never do damage. A 7 star, 7 red star, gear tier 14 Mordo will still not do damage. He'll just have higher focus. This team doesn't have a focus problem to begin with. Mordo is very good at what he does. He doesn't need to be very strong. And if Scarlet Witch and Mordo are dying all the time, having a strong Doctor Strange, both in gear and investment, one, will make his heal better, two, will make his res more reliable, three, will make him tankier, especially with those deflects he gets from a tier four, uh, overall, Doctor Strange is uh, unfortunately the one of the most important characters on the Supernatural team, just because Scarlet Witch is basically there because she has no other home, and Mordo doesn't actually need any investment. That doesn't mean, again, like we said, that doesn't mean you don't have to invest in other characters to make them good. That doesn't mean they become the powerhouse of a team or the hard counter of a team without investment. That just means if you have to choose characters to work on, this would probably be the three in whichever order makes the most sense for your current setup. Uh, the Wakandans, you'll notice an asterisk right there. It says sucky, because the Wakandans suck. I'm sorry, they suck. So I had to think about it. Where are the Wakandans? Well, they're not a raid team, even though they can be, and they're not really a war team, even though they can be. So what am I gonna do with the Wakandans? Uh, well, uh, we're gonna work on the Wakandans in the same way we work on anyone else. We're gonna assume they're a raid team, and the truth of the matter is, Black Panther just doesn't do damage unless you charge him up, right? That's the that's the core of Black Panther. If he's not supercharged when he ults, he's not gonna do a lot of damage. Yes, he'll have extra turns. Yes, he does allow this team to, to kind of farm certain fights, but, and it hurts to say it, a strong M'Baku just will never take damage. He's not as good a tank as some other characters, especially for a raid, but when he is taunting, it, he just will never take damage. So if you have Shuri, Killmonger, and M'Baku as your highest invested characters, uh, Killmonger will be the primary damage dealer. Uh, Black Panther, since you don't actually ever have to ult with him, and because the way this team is designed is more to kind of let him ult to pick off characters that are low health, you can sustain the team with those three characters long enough that Okoye and Black Panther's investment isn't incredibly relevant. I think Okoye is actually the worst on this team to invest in because you kind of need to invest in her, and even when you do, she's still not very reliable at the action she takes. Uh, X-Force, I don't think this is going to come as any shock to anybody. Uh, Deadpool and Domino do not need to be strong. As a matter of fact, if Deadpool and Domino both die in the first round of the fight, you could still win many fights with just these three characters. That's how strong they are overall. Uh, people will make an argument like, but if Deadpool isn't this high against this comp, then he won't gain the taunt. And the answer is it doesn't actually matter. X-23 literally doesn't take damage because she's dodging all the time. Megasonic Teenage Warhead has an infinite supply of shield that never goes out. And Cable is literally a 
brick house. Like he does not take damage. So yes, I understand the idea and the theory working of having strong characters with strong setup. But if you want to win fights, these are the three characters that are going to do it. It's not going to be Domino. It's not going to be Deadpool. It's going to be those three. So these are the Trinity for the X Force. X Men. It took a lot of effort to put Cyclops in this fight because the X Men doesn't have a Trinity. It's Phoenix, Colossus, and three other X Men characters. Or not. It doesn't actually matter. The truth is. If you had to pick an X-Man to be the third to invest in, it would be Cyclops. Uh, just what he offers the team is, is pure damage plus a little bit of control. Ultimately, a pretty decent character. Uh, he gets a, you know he assists every time someone tags Phoenix. Just a great character all around. Big damage dealing, and that's what the X-Men team is. It's a war offense team overall. It's not a raid team, obviously. Even with Beast, not a raid team. And I did factor in Beast, who is available, and he doesn't make the cut, because he's not worth the investment. So that's the X-Men 3. And Brawlers, I saved for the last with the three asterisks there, because there is no Brawlers team. We've kind of discussed this before. Uh, but in this magic world where you do want to put Brawlers together, whether it be on War Offense or War Defense or Blitz or Arena or whatever you want to do, the core of the Brawlers team is going to always be CM, Ms. Marvel, and America Chavez. The same reason why I don't have the symbiotes here, because there's three of them. Like, I'm not going to tell you which three of the three characters to invest in. They're clearly the best. But the Brawlers, these are the three characters that are constantly put together because they all impact each other so meaningfully. Outside of that, there aren't there aren't two other Brawlers. You also notice Young Avengers aren't on this team because they're not a team. And even if they were, this would be the Young Avengers team and these would be the characters I invested in. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't necessarily worry about Squirrel Girl's investment uh, right now anyway. She's kind of a utility character to begin with. And Miles, while phenomenal, is again, not a character that needs high stats in order to be phenomenal so overall this is the kind of setup i have for the trios you know comment below and let me know where your investment line is on some of these characters uh, obviously if you have you know an incredibly high red star toad you may say but tony my toad does this and i'm like no that's fair this is not uh, a rule of which characters should always be the strongest versions of the team this is just the cores of the teams that if you invest in them you will literally never regret it this way you can have a functional version of a team without spending the resources that are so slim anyway thanks guys so much for watching have a good night have a great day i've been tony scongeli and i'll catch you later